Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neil Love from Research to Practice, and welcome to Year in Review. As today we talk about the most recent data sets in gynecologic oncology. We have a great faculty today, Dr. Michael Beer from the Rockefeller Cancer Institute, University of Arkansas in Little Rock, and Dr. Katie Moore from uh, the Stephenson uh, Cancer Center at the University of Oklahoma in Oklahoma City. Dr. Krishna Tiwari also participated in this program from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, the way we do this series, uh, as, as we do all these programs the same way, I meet with the faculty ahead of time, and then we do a live webinar. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. But as always, in all of our webinars, if you have any questions or cases you'd like to run by our faculty, just type them into the chat room. We'll talk about as many of these as we have time. We put out a real quick uh, two-minute uh, quiz in the beginning and the end of the program. If you take that, you'll get a lot more out of what we're going to talk about here today. We know a lot of people end up listening to our webinars, and if you're into audio program, check out our Oncology Today podcast series, including a recent program on PARP inhibition and ovarian cancer with Dr. Herzog. We do webinars all the time. Tomorrow we're doing a real interesting experiment. We're following up two uh, extensive Oncology Today pieces with a shorter program tomorrow night. We'll be covering two topics, thyroid cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. We'll be talking about a bunch of cases. And then on Thursday, we'll be working with Dr. Raji from uh, MGH for the last program in our Meet the Professor Multiple Myeloma series. Next week, we're going to start out a new series in breast cancer, ER positive, triple negative disease with Dr. Javari. And then we'll be doing another year in review program, this one on lymphomas with Drs. Flower and Sen uh, on Wednesday the 1st. We're going to be doing a real interesting program also on the 2nd, uh, Thursday, February 2nd, focused on BTK inhibitors, uh, specifically the issue of adverse events. But today we're here to talk about gynecologic oncology, what's happened over the past year. And the way we do this is we have the faculty work with me separately. So I met with uh, Katie separately and recorded a presentation reviewing key papers on ovarian cancer. And I met with Dr. Tawari also to record uh, his presentation reviewing key papers on endometrial cancer and cervical cancer. And Dr. Beer will be joining us today. Here are the papers uh, that are covered uh, in these uh, programs. We're not going to go through all these. These are very comprehensive. A lot of data sets are covered. Uh, check out both of these presentations. Uh, and you'll get more details about uh, some of the key things that have been presented. We're going to talk about a bunch of these things here today and try to explore a little bit about clinical implications, but also research implications. So here's where we're heading. We're going to chat a little bit about taking care of patients in the real world first, and then we'll jump into the papers first with ovarian cancer. We'll cover a bunch of things, particularly PARP inhibitors, but also antibody drug conjugates, really interesting uh, issue for all of oncology. Then we'll talk about endometrial cancer. Of course, we'll get into checkpoint inhibitors, but also novel agents, including some interesting data on cell and exer, which we, of course, talk a lot about in our myeloma series. And then we'll finish out with uh, some papers on cervical cancer, again, particularly the issue of immunotherapy. But faculty, I want to just start out a little bit, and I was kind of reflecting on our work when we work with urologists on programs on urologic cancer, how the urologists get involved. And Katie, you know, one of the issues is sort of when, when do you, when does the handoff occur between the gynecologist or the gynecologic oncologist uh, and the medical oncologist? I'm curious what your experience is right now uh, in this sort of rural setting, uh, Katie, and some of the issues that come up uh, as you see uh, patients receiving care in the community. Thanks for that. Oklahoma is um, a, a very large state uh, with a very large population that exists uh, in rural counties. And there's a lot of intersection, not entirely, but intersection between sort of geographic, financial and ethnic disparities that do contribute to some barriers for our patients at obtaining care. That being said, uh, our practice has been here for decades uh, and really has established relationships with the community medical oncologists. And so they're um, very apt to sort of send 
patients in for initial assessment and initial treatments with us. Uh, and sometimes the patients will return to the communities to get, you know, if we're just giving paclitaxel and carboplatin, that being, can be given in the community without an issue. Um, and then they'll come here if we have clinical trials that pertain to them and, and can offer some benefit. So we have a really, I think, unique relationship within the state where there's sort of back and forth between community medical oncologists who are in practice all over our state and then our sort of central location in Oklahoma City uh, that usually equates to, I think, the patients getting very good care and access to kind of cutting edge therapies through uh, clinical trials. Uh, rarely we see patients that are cared for in the community by very intelligent medical oncologists who just don't see a lot of gynecologic cancers and may not be as familiar with some of the new molecular testing, interpretation of the molecular testing and how we sequence some of the new approvals in, in cervical, endometrial and ovarian cancer. And so we'll see some you know, potential missteps with how someone might be treated. But fortunately, I think that's a rare occurrence here. So, Mike, I'm curious in your perspective, you know, you came from um, MGH in Boston, very different scenario than where you are right now in Arkansas. You know, again, when we work with, uh, when we do programs at AUA or with urologists, uh, we see that a lot of, uh, you see big practices in urology and often they'll have one or two docs who's focused on urologic cancer. Is that what you see with gynecologic oncology and kind of what's the difference in your, in sort of the community care and the patients them, that you're seeing themselves uh, here compared to Boston? Yeah, it's a great point, uh, Neil. I, I, um, I spent about 10 years in the Harvard system and that was really fundamentally different. It, it's really, it's a little bit like Memorial, a little bit like uh, MD Anderson, a, a referral system, if you will. Patients will come in um, and, and I always joke that they'll, they'll plop down 20, you know, 200 pages of Google searches uh, because they're very well educated and they're looking and you may be the fifth, uh, second opinion. Um, and for that reason, perhaps, medonks play a much bigger role in Boston than I've found here in Little Rock. I, I would say the experience so far in Little Rock is a lot like what Katie said in Oklahoma. We're community-based. We're the academic center. I, I think the challenges for this uh, field is twofold. One in the gynogs is that they spend a lot of time in the OR, so it's hard to keep up with the evolving complexity of the systemic treatment of these diseases. In the Menog side, uh, it's also a challenge because they treat the big four, you know, prostate, lung, breast, and colorectal, and they don't see a lot of endometrial and um, ovary. So uh, it's, a, it's a bit new for them, too. So I, we've got education on both levels uh, to provide the best care possible. All right, well, let's jump into the papers, and we're going to start out with certainly one of the major stories in general in gynecologic oncology over the last few years, the use of PARP inhibitors in ovarian cancer. And Katie, I love the way you summarize the key trials here. Um, this uh, looking at uh, data on BRCA of the five trials uh, that looked at phase three trials, looking at upfront therapy. Before we get into more specifics about what we see in trials like this, could you just comment on the two of the more recent additions? So on the right there, you have the Athena trial looking at Rucapra that was presented at uh, ASCO last summer, but also the PRIME study that was done in Asia. Can you talk a little bit about those two studies and how their findings sort of sync up with uh, the other trials we'd already seen? Absolutely. The, uh, I'll start with the Athena study, which our colleague, Dr. Bradley Monk, presented at ASCO just in 2022. And this was the long-awaited frontline study uh, of Rucaparib. Very similar in design to the other frontline studies where women with uh, advanced stage high-grade serous or endometrioid tumors that were in response to frontline paclitaxel and carboplatin were offered um, participated participation in the switch maintenance trial of rucaparib versus placebo. Now, just to be clear, the Athena trial has four arms. It's rucaparib versus rucaparib, nivolumab versus nivolumab versus um, placebo. The um, placebo and the nivolumab arms were um, randomized 
kind of one to one and then four to four for the other two. So it's four to four to one to one randomization. There's two studies in this. One is Athena Mono, which you see here, which is the question of Rucapra versus placebo. And then what we haven't seen yet is Athena Combo, which is Rucapra versus Rucapra Nivolumab. Just to be clear, Athena is a bigger study than, than what I have here. But this is just the subset analysis of BRCA um, associated cancers. And it's here just to really demonstrate the consistency of signal we see across the studies, irrespective of the nuances of eligibility criteria uh, and, you know, patient selection, irrespective of uh, country of enrollment, you know, all the way from China to Europe, very consistent, unprecedented improvement in progression-free survival with use of any PARP inhibitor after response to frontline chemotherapy, and that's confirmed in Athena Mono. Um, the PRIME study uh, was a very interesting study that we have not seen the paper for this one yet. We've just seen the presentation. Uh, again, it was all comers. This was done entirely in China. I have it grouped here with uh, Niraparib, and it is technically Niraparib, but it's manufactured through a different company in China, as, as regulatory requirements are. And the BRCA testing here is the same BRCA testing that we get everywhere. This study, uh, as we may or may not talk about, had HRD testing as well that was modeled after the Myriad test, the three components, but wasn't the Myriad test. So it's a, it has some nuances. You can't just say it's Niraparib with a Myriad test. But again, just looking at the BRCA population here in China, very consistent, very unprecedented improvement in PFS that really argues that maintenance PARP inhibitor is the standard of care to offer any patient with a BRCA-associated cancer following response to frontline chemotherapy. So, Mike, uh, putting aside uh, regulatory issues and the fact that the Rucaparib has not yet uh, been approved in this setting, but sort of putting that aside, any preference uh, that you would have or have right now about choice of PARP inhibitor in a patient with a BRCA somatic or germline mutation, but also duration of treatment, how long are you going to use it? Yeah, great question. Yeah, I, I've been a big believer of the fact that from an efficacy standpoint, essentially all PARPs are created equal. I do think they have different toxicity profiles. Um, I think that, and the rapper is certainly associated with some thrombocytopenia, there are some unusual recaparib effects, uh, elevated creatinine, some transaminases, so on and so forth. None of them are really uh, side effects or toxicities that would eliminate them. But because of that and because of the historic control or the historic perspective and because Katie Moore is my friend, I almost always use for BRCA mutated patients uh, a laparib. And of course, uh, Katie was the PI on the first study, and the one I think we have the most follow-up on the Solo One study, and we saw more data from all these trials this year, Katie. But this was particularly interesting: the survival data from Solo One, a really nice hazard rate of 0.55. Anything else you want to say about that, Katie? Well, I think it's just important to note this, as uh, we may or may not get to talk about today. There has there's been an appropriate focus on overall survival. We all care about overall survival. There have been some retractions of PARP inhibitors in the recurrent setting based on overall survival data that is very flawed. You know, we can talk about that, um, but it's put a big um, spotlight on overall survival. And in frontline ovarian cancer, because the post-progression survival is so long, it has been nearly impossible to really comment on overall survival ever. And now we finally can. And we're showing in Solo One, this is an interim analysis. It is not the final, but at seven years, there's a real big difference between patients who are alive and patients who are not alive. But more importantly to me is this slide. Uh, and now I care about overall survival and I always have. But now I can care about, am I curing patients? We've never talked about that ever. In fact, we tell patients it's highly unlikely that we expect recurrences. Isn't that a terrible thing? But we look at SOLA1, which is a specific clinical risk group. It's all stage 3, 4, but they were lower clinical risk than Prima or Paula or Athena. We have to say that out loud. But these are advanced stage ovarian cancer 
patience. Uh, and this is the updated, we, this is time to, to first subsequent therapy at seven years, which is basically an updated progression-free survival. And what you see is at seven years, we have 45% of patients who are originally randomized to a laparib, they have never recurred. So they've been off all therapy for at least five years. And that's compared to 20% of the women who are randomized to placebo. So what it tells us is that there are a subset of patients, and we've always known about them. They're the ones that are cured with nothing. Who are they? And how can I identify them so I can leave them alone? I would love to know that, but I can't tell it yet. And so I'm going to overtreat that 20% to get an additional 25% of women into this cure fraction. Because if you look at the slope of that curve at seven years, it's flat. So we may have a few more recurrences over the next few years, but the vast majority of those patients, in my opinion, are cured. They're not on therapy. They're not alive. They're alive without disease. And that's amazing. We've never talked about that. And that's amazing. So um, we just have to emphasize that. This is the place where you use PARP, frontline. You don't wait. The other, uh, so, if I can just inject, uh, Neil, the, the other value on this which we don't really have time to talk about, is that this is really long-term data, and, and there was no bump up in AML or uh, MDS. So that's very reassuring, because that's still looming out there using a DNA repair inhibitor, that not, that might be a problem. No signal. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that. We, we saw more data coming out of the PRIMA just, uh, trial, uh, also, and Katie goes through this in detail. If you want to go through each one of these studies, the Athena trial uh, with uh, Rucaprib. Uh, but also, and I'm curious, Mike, uh, how you approach these patients, uh, patients who are BRCA wild type, but HR deficient versus HR proficient, um, where you have an indication for uh, Neuraparib. And it looked like the data in uh, Athena was also uh, positive. What's your approach? Uh, somatic BRCA mutations, uh, HR deficient on LOH score, for example, Mike, you treat them the same way as BRCA mutant? Yeah, I think, again, excellent point. Um, so I, I think that um, um, HRD is an important biomarker. It is somewhat flawed. It's not perfect. Um, there's a um, clear benefit of, to those patients who are HR deficient uh, to receive uh, part maintenance. I don't think there's any issue on that. I'm a big BEV fan, which I know we're not going to get into very much. So it's very easy for me in the HRD population up front. They're likely already on BEV. I just add a laparib because of Apollo 1. Um, the, the, the group that's debatable, I think, is HR proficient. And the reason is, is that there's a signal in for, from Neuraparib and now a signal from Athena Mono that there is a benefit in those, in that patient population. So remember, this is, this, this, these are tumors that are genomically intact. They're stable. Um, but you have hazard ratios. You can see them up there, 0.65, roughly, uh, actually for both, uh, in favor of using a PARP inhibitor. But I would point out that um, if you actually look at the hard numbers, you're talking about roughly two to three months prolongation of PFS. Uh, and in my book, generally speaking, that's not sufficient. Uh, in those pa in that patient population, most of the time, if I have a nice clinical trial, I'll put them on clinical trial. Uh, but if I don't, then I save uh, a, a PARP inhibitor to a little bit later. Okay, well, I want to ask you about the other issue that we've heard a lot about this year. There's been a bunch of dear doctor letters, and, you know, it really, I think it also influenced how people looked at the uh, Athena data to start with, and that is the issue of PARP was in the recurrent setting and this question of whether, as Katie was alluding to, there's an increase in mortality. But quickly, uh, first, Katie, uh, Gonzalo in the chat room from Argentina, hey, how you doing there? Uh, ask about the issue of duration of maintenance. I brought this up before. Uh, Neuraparib, uh, the Prima study, was three years. As so I was curious, uh, Katie, do you use three years? And Gonzalo wants to know, if you have high volume disease, would you go beyond two years, for example, with the Laparib? So that is 
really one of the million dollar questions. And the truth is we just don't have data. So I really try to individualize it. I do believe that we should be using PARP inhibitors when we're using them for maintenance, you know, in a patient that otherwise does not have evidence of disease, it should be for a limited period of time. And the, the, the clinical risk group for solo one, I firmly believe that's two years. Um, and it can make people nervous. It makes me nervous. Like, I don't want to do something that harms a patient, but you can do that both ways. And the, the indefinite use of PARP inhibitor in someone that doesn't need it can cause harm. You know, then we may see an uptick of treatment-related myeloid neoplasms or impact how patients respond to subsequent platinum-based therapies. So I really feel like it needs to be a fixed time period. Now, Gonzalo's question is very appropriate because Solo one, again, it was stage three and four, but mostly stage three and mostly primary side reduction to no gross residual. So it was this kind of niche group, not low risk, lower high risk. Prima, very high risk, clinically incredibly high risk, 70% neoadjuvant almost, 40% stage four, lots of partial responses. So you're treating a group of patients who may have had a great response to therapy, but there's still a lot of cells there comparatively. And the duration of PARP may be important in prolonging the progression-free survival. I do not think it converts more patients to cure. If you're going to cure patients, you're wiping out whatever clones are left like pretty quickly when you start the PARP. If you don't wipe them out, you're probably just controlling it for a period of time. And maybe three years buys you a little bit more time in this incredibly high-risk population. That's completely hypothesis statement, like no data. I have no problem going to three, though, um, because the data is there for safety from from Prima. Um, But I would not do it indefinitely unless I had evidence that I'm treating disease. And then you just say you're treating disease and you're going to treat disease till the disease grows. That's different than this maintenance concept of sort of trying to consolidate the gains of frontline chemotherapy. But it's a um, length of therapy is a hot topic. And, you know, I think we're going to have to see if we ever study it. All right. Well, I want to t- uh, take a shot, another shot, because uh, we've talked about this many times in webinars. And I still, to be honest, I'm pretty confused. I don't mind admitting it. I don't know if there's anybody else out there about what's going on with all these dear, dear doctor letters. And please look at Katie's talk for a Talmudic discussion of every single one of those trials. <laughs> I you did. Know, you, want to sp- you want to spend a weekend thinking about it. But I just want to cut to the bottom line. Interestingly, right in the chat room as we're getting started, Anita submits a case. So listen to the beginning of this, okay? Because this is exactly the scenario that I wanted to ask you about. 74-year-old woman with ovarian cancer diagnosed through stage 3B in 2017. She gets carbotaxol pre-op and post-op, then maintenance BEV. 2021, so four years later, progression. I'm trying to think, 2017, this hadn't come out yet, right, Katie? When did Solo 1 first, the first presentation? 18. Yeah, it proved right. okay, in 18. So right, yeah. right before that, okay. So then she gets a progression in the abdomen, carbodoxal BEV times four, then maintenance BEV, now has progression again. So uh, the uh, BRCA uh, wild type, and I think I see, yeah, LOH low, less than 16. But Mike, that ties into this question that with all this discussion we've had about all these trials and relapse disease, you know, we can get into this case, but, you know, she's got all kinds of things, with, you know, that we could get into, but that's the, the, the scenario. So my question is, if you have a patient who uh, has a, a variant cancer in the past and got treated primarily with surgery and, you know, adjuvant chemo, but no PARP inhibitor, and then develops recurrent disease, what I want to know is, do you integrate a PARP? Would you like to? You know, let's put reimbursement and all the stuff going on with the FDA aside. Mike, would you like to use a PARP inhibitor? And does it matter if the patient, let's say, has BRCA germline or like this patient of Anita who's completely, you know, BRCA wild type LOH negative? So let's start with uh, Anita's case. 
a patient who's BRCA, wild type, LOH negative, but has not had a primary PARP. Would you be thinking about a PARP at some point for that woman? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a great question. And um, thankfully, because of Katie's data and others' data, most of these patients are getting treated up front with PARP. And so these are becoming vanishingly rare. Having said that, I just saw a platinum resistant patient who is germline mutated and never been and never seen a part. So they do exist still. Now, in this particular case, if I understood it correctly, it was Anita. Uh, this is a uh, LOH low BRCA wild type, correct? Yeah. I, you know, right. again, I, I think most of the time, even with the Nova data. Uh, and Aerial 3, which were recurrent studies, the effects of PARP inhibitors in those scenarios were um, pretty modest. I mean, you're talking small small effects. And I, I think we have better combinations for that. So it would not come to mind first for me. If they were platinum-resistant, it would be sort of an Aurelia study, Taxol, um, Bev, um, and then, you know, the usual for platinum-sensitive recurrence, She's had doxel with carboplatinum and pack attack, uh, she had doxel with that and Beth, but there's also carbogem and other choices. So that's for the proficient so, wild type. Okay. And let, and let me just clarify before we get to Katie. So, um, if you wanted to use a PARP, would you be able to with the current stuff going on with the FDA? Uh, so, so when solo three and, and quadra was, was pulled back, there are very quadra, aerial four, and solo three, all precipitated this withdrawal of the agents. There are specific recurrences that theoretically the insurance company now can deny approval. So uh, the further you get out on patients, those decisions, yeah, actually do have an impact. So I, I, I de depending specifically on that case, it is possible that it would be difficult to treat that patient with a PARP inhibitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the other scenario, and you said you just had a patient like this, uh, and I saw Katie make a face because I, you would hate to see somebody with a germline mutation not get a PARP, but you know, it, it happens. And remember, too, some of these people get diagnosed in 2017. But again, and I don't know what you did with that patient, but you've got a patient who's got a recurrence, has never had a PARP, where, if at all, and again, let's put aside regulatory issues, and I want to know whether regulatory issues would affect you in this situation. Would you use a PARP inhibitor, Mike? Which one and how would you use it? Would you use it chemo followed by PARP maintenance for recurrence, PARP alone? Where does PARP fit in a patient like that? Yeah, I, I think, um, again, depends a little bit on details, but if the patient um, has recurred, if, they're, if they get induction chemotherapy that chases away their tumor, but they're germline mutated, never saw a PARP inhibitor, I would use it as maintenance. If um, they're really not a candidate for another platinum uh, regimen or induction, then I'd use it as a single agent. And in this particular case, I did that. The insurance company did not challenge it, even though it was during the breaking of uh, Quadra and Solo 3. I think it will probably become increasingly difficult. The, the bad news is it will become increasingly difficult to do that. The good news is I think we'll see less and less than that because they're going to be getting their PARP inhibitors up front. I'm just trying to, you know, kind of clarifying right now, like what you do and where the FDA fits in. So again, I'm going to go back to you, Katie. You've got a patient who did not get a primary PARP, let's say both BRCA and, you know, wild type. Do you, would you want to use a PARP inhibitor? And can you with the current FDA situation? Yes, you still can. Uh, and so if someone didn't get it frontline and now they've recurred and they are considered sensitive or appropriate for platinum and you reinduced with platinum, either platinum PLD or platinum gem or platinum paclitaxel and the tumor response because remember response to platinum in the platinum sensitive setting is the key biomarker for benefit of part. The biomarkers are important, but if you don't respond to the platinum, if you're kind of stable, that PARP's not going to help. If that tumor shrinks, I don't really care what the biomarker says. I want to use a PARP. Now, if I want to use a PARP, currently the only one that still has an all-comer indication is olaparib. The indication beyond, outside of BRCA was retracted for niraparib. So you can only use second-line 
you know, or whatever, platinum sensitive maintenance, doesn't matter what line it is, niraparib in BRCA. And they're pushing for that for rucaparib. To my understanding, that indication has not been officially retracted yet, but I believe it will be if it hasn't. And maybe I just haven't checked. So, so a laparib still hanging on, but you know they're going to be under the, the radar here. So it may change. Uh, in a patient whose tumor is platinum resistant, then um, I don't really think there's any role for a PARP inhibitor there in a BRCA wild type setting. It just doesn't work. Now, combinations we're not talking about. I don't think we have time to go into that today, and those are all on trials. But monotherapy PARP inhibitor in a platinum-resistant tumor does not work. In a patient like Mike's, or Dr. Beers, pardon me, who has is PARP naive and BRCA mutated, those indications were retracted, solo 3 and aerial 4. And I would counsel a patient about that and why and what the questions are and and if she wanted to try it, I would probably try and get it for her. But insurance may deny it to to Dr. Beer's correct point. We may not get it. So this is kind of like the Talmud. You have to take it a little bit at a time, and maybe eventually, finally, you get it. But again, uh, check out uh, Katie's presentation. Here's some of the slides uh, where she goes through this, including uh, the ASCO guidelines, uh, some really interesting stuff about BRCA reversion mutations, which we're not going to be able to get into very interesting data looking at the combination of PARP, IO, in this case, Zervalumab and BEV, the Mediola study that we're going to see more data from. But I want to also get your take on antibody drug conjugates. And Mike, I feel like we talk about that in almost every tumor type nowadays, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, Hodgkin, multiple myeloma, bladder cancer has two antibody drug conjugates approved in metastatic disease, breast cancer, two anti-HER, you, know, you can go on and on. And hey, here it is, uh, ovarian, and we'll talk l later about cervical cancer. So Mervituximab and, well, I call it UPRI for short. Uh, so first, uh, Mervituximab. Mike, can you kind of give us a, a, you know, a summary of your take on that, but in particular your clinical experience with it, when you use it, and how you use it? Yeah, so um, Merv is a really fascinating drug, um, and it's here to stay. Uh, yeah, we've done a lot. We've done a lot of work, and most of my work was done uh, when I was up at MGH. It's an antibody uh, that binds to the folate receptor alpha, which is a um, I, I would I would venture to say almost the perfect cancer surface biomarker because it's highly overexpressed in ovarian cancer. It's actually overexpressed a, a bit in endometrial cancer and even lung cancer, um, but is not expressed very much in, in in normal tissues, a little bit in renal tubules and a little bit in alveolar type 2 cells. Um, and the antibody binds, the payload is a very, it's DM4, it's very, very toxic. It gets endocytosed, released, kills the cell, but it kills the cells around it. So there's a big bystander effect. Uh, so my experience has been, um, we've probably put 30 patients on the phase one and in the uh, expansion cohort. I had patients on for almost two years. And Katie had a lot of experience with this drug too. Um, so it definitely works, no doubt about it. And the quality of life uh, was terrific in most of those patients. Uh, and you're showing now the Soraya duration response, which is the follow-up study. The forward one, which Katie and I were co-PIs on, was a negative study, but but there was a reason for that, and it was mostly how the biomarker was measured. Um, and this is the follow-up study. And you can see here the median duration response is 6.9 months. This is in a platinum-resistant patient population. Um, and there are complete responses and a lot of partial responses. Very active drug. So, Katie, I never thought I would do an entire CME program on ophthalmic issues in oncology, but we actually did that recently because so many of these ADCs and more uh, others uh, have ophthalmic issues. Uh, what's your experience with uh, mervituximab in terms of toxicity, particularly the ophthalmic issues? How do you prevent it and manage it? So thanks for that. The, uh, just to echo what Dr. Beer said, this is an incredibly well-tolerated agent. The toxicity profile, we say it's a very differentiated toxicity profile from standard chemotherapy. So almost no hematologic toxicity which is so nice. I cannot tell you, I have a patient right now that I'm 
testing. I'm just praying she's positive because she just lives at 80 platelets. I mean, I just cannot give her standard therapies anymore, but I'm going to give her this if she's positive and it'll be safe to do. Um, so you give folks a chance to sort of heal their bone marrow with this agent. Um, so negligible heme, GI toxicity is really related to the um, infusion. So nausea that we can mitigate does have about 30% of patients with some low-grade diarrhea that's managed with over-the-counter medication. So you have to just um, make sure patients are aware of that. But the eye toxicity is really what we've worked on tremendously. And we've had a great uh, ophthalmologic team, corneal specialists, retinal specialists from some of the leading cancer centers. These are like oncologic ophthalmologists um, working with us. And so what we see, I tell patients about 50% of patients on Mervituximab will have some eye toxicity. That could range from dry eye to blurry vision to what we call um, keratopathy, where you have some kind of damage to the corneal epithelium. It's 100% reversible. Um, we mitigate it with lubricating preservative-free eye drops. And still currently, we're using steroid eye drops. Um, well, I hope in the future, we'll do some studies with some different agents to try and see if we can decrease the use of steroid eye drops. But right now, those are still in the in the mix. Uh, and just good eye hygiene. And I think while that sounds daunting to patients, the proof in the pudding is that of all the patients we've treated, you know, I presented, I had the honor of presenting a poster last year about, uh, it was a pooled analysis, almost 500 patients. We had a 1% discontinuation rate because of eye toxicity. So these are important. You have to pay attention to them. Patients have to have an optometrist or an ophthalmologist because the FDA label requires that we have a test every other cycle for the first eight cycles and we need to follow that. But the drug works and it can be um, very well tolerated by patients and the eye toxicity has a great mitigation strategy. So don't let it so dissuade talk, patients. So let's talk about the other antibody drug conjugate. Mike, I saw this uh, really cool paper that you did, cancer treatment reviews, looking at uh, NAP12B in ovarian cancer. Would you like to take a shot? It's been a while since I kind of went through this physiology. You want to sort of bring us up to speed on what how this works and uh, what we see with it? Yeah, sure. I'm NAPI2B, as we call it. It's a sodium-dependent phosphate transporter. And the interesting issue, it's a little bit like folate um, receptor alpha, is it's not clear that it plays much of a role in the development of cancer. It just happens to be overexpressed, though, in ovary, lung, papillary thyroid, and breast. Uh, it is almost as good of a cell surface marker as folate receptor alpha. Um, and, um, you know, it's been around for a while. The um, I think the breakthrough is really the company working with new technology to provide Upray, which is listed right here, which is, again, another antibody drug conjugate. But there, there are a couple points to be made. So first of all, um, it's a great antibody. It binds appropriately. But the um, technology here for the antibody drug conjugate is a polymer scaffold. And what that does is it allows for more payload per antibody. In fact, their newer technology actually allows them to define the amount of drug per antibody and make sure all the antibodies have, you know, six molecules or 12 molecules. So at some point in the future, you know, it'd be interesting to see what Gay thinks about this. I think we're going to be doing randomized studies between six molecules and 12 to figure out which one gives the best toxicity to, to efficacy ratio. But that's coming. This thing is really um, quite good technology. The, the um, drug itself is a pro-drug. So it's not even if it breaks off and is in the serum, it's not all that active. So again, another way to limit toxicity. And the initial data, you're showing the waterfall plot here. I always like to say there's a lot of water over that falls. You can see <laughs> um, on the right side. And in fact, even though if you look at the response rates, um, there's a huge area in the middle of that where they don't qualify for a response, but they've got controlled disease. So again, the, the initial data here is, I think, quite exciting. Uh, that this is also another active agent. NAPI2B overlaps fully receptor alpha, but not exclusively. And not, it, it's so in other words, you could probably have a cancer treat one with uh, MERV 
And then if patient recurs, come back with this particular antibody drug conjugate. Uh, these, these antibody drug conjugates are here to stay. We're going to be using a lot more of them, and we're probably going to move them up front. So, Katie, if you're, if you're in phase one. I don't know if you ever heard of Zolbituximab, antibody no. to Claudin eight. Yeah, antibody to Claudin eighteen point two. Last week at the GI ASCO Symposium, <laughs> phase three randomized trial showing uh, improvement in not only PFS but also survival. So now you've got Claudin eighteen point two plus PD one. You got to check out when you get upper GI cancers. I don't know where we're heading. Uh, in terms of, uh, of oh, cool. uh, ovarian cancer. Uh, but, you know, in terms of the Venn diagram of how does, uh, f- folate and, uh, the target here overlap. But you gave a great sort of summary of the clinical issues uh, when you use, uh, Mervituximab. What about UPRI? What do you see clinically, both in terms of response, uh, so speed of response, uh, but also tolerability? Uh, I think we'll get a lot more data about upafitimab when the kind of pivotal registration trial, um, this is up next, which is the confirmatory trial, but um, uplift, which was led by my partner, Dr. Deborah Richardson, who's right next door listening to this. Um, when we see that data, which was all done at the kind of correct RP2D dose level, I think we'll have a, a much more solid sense of efficacy and to- tolerability we were involved in the phase one where we went up quite high. Um, and so the efficacy signal is strong in uh, biomarker positive tumors, which they are selecting for in this ma- maintenance study that you have up here. The response rate in platinum resistant tumors is well over 40%, which is, which is quite high. It's not bad in biomarker low either, but there just definitely is a gradation of, of responses there. So I think the activity signal here is quite strong and we'll see a strong signal in the uplift study that we'll likely read out this year. The toxicities are well tolerated. I will say it's not as well to- tolerated as a Mervituximab, probably because of the higher DAR. As um, Dr. Beer pointed out, there's more payload getting in here. And so patients definitely feel it. We see some more fatigue. Uh, and so we have to sort of just set expectations correctly with patients. Um and pre-medicate for nausea. Uh, those two things are really key. But at the current dose and at this dose, so for maintenance, they're coming in at 30. Um, it's 34 or 32 for um, monotherapy dosing. I'm forgetting. I apologize. Um, um, for maintenance, we don't need to be as high. Those really intentional decisions, I think, have made this a uh, very tolerable medication. At high doses, we did see some pneumonitis, but we have not seen that anymore at the current dose. So uh, I think this is really going to be another strong therapeutic option for our patients. The um, expression levels here, about two-thirds of patients are um, sodium-dependent phosphate channel high, and it overlaps a little bit with folate receptor alpha, but not entirely. So they are different populations. Um so it's going to be great to have two options. And, you know, some of the things that you have been talked about, the, the, the payload, et cetera, uh, the chemo-like side effects, we hear that uh, with TDXD, trastuzumab, daratuxin in breast cancer, but also lung cancer, upper GI cancer, really effective, maybe, you know, her too low. But again, some chemo side effects. So we'll see how this plays out. So I want to talk about endometrial cancer, and uh, uh, Dr. Tawari went through, again, went through this comprehensively. We're not going to go through every paper, particularly some of the things I think that have been out there a couple years. But actually, Mike, I think the most exciting thing that uh, we talked about was a paper that we don't have data on because all we have is a positive press release, the Ruby study. But as is often the case in oncology, once you see that press release, you know something's about to happen. Uh, can you talk about, well, of course, we don't have any of the data, Mike. I don't know. Maybe it'll get be presented at SGO or ASCO. Uh, maybe you two know the data, but I'm sure you wouldn't share it anyhow. But uh, curious what your thoughts are about this first-line chemo plus IO dose Starlimab, Mike. Yeah. So, I, you know, again, um, this is a logical study. It was very appropriately timed. It moved and it reflects the fact the field is moving very fast. So as you know, this all burst on the scene 
with one you know, Keynote 158, um, and it, it evolved very fast. We know that patients who have um, defective mismatch repair respond just like the colorectal patients, actually. That started it. Uh, it's moved fast. Um, we have other combinations that are relevant for the stable patients. And then, again, logically, it's moving earlier in the treatment of endometrial cancer. That's what Ruby is. So Ruby uses one agent that came a little bit late to the dance. It was after Prembolizumab, but um, is, for all intents and purposes, a wonderful anti-PD-1 molecule. It was actually the only one that's been tested in a Q6 uh, dosing, although now Pembro is approved for that. And you can see the design right here. It's it's the chemo that we give as standard, and that's the placebo arm versus the Starlamab plus chemo. We expected this to be positive. I mean, I think a lot of us expected this to be positive. And so when we saw this, we weren't shocked, but we were very excited about it. Um, and I think that's about all I can say. <laughs> so, Katie, you know, this comes in the background. And again, um, uh, we reviewed this. Uh, Krishna reviewed this. Uh, we saw updates for some of these, for example, the Garnett study, MSI high disease. Uh, one of the things that I think a lot of people have been asking me about, Mike referred to uh, colorectal cancer. Of course, we just did a huge symposium last week on that at GI ASCO. But there they, they use IO, they're using neoadjuvant IO and MSI high and GI cancers, but they use it first line. So, Katie, how come you all aren't using it first line? I know you don't have the data, but I mean, does it bother you to give chemo? Um, a little bit. We are doing the study now, though. There is a study in MSI high, mismatch repair deficient tumors, that is uh, pembrolizumab versus paclitaxel and carboplatin uh, for first line metastatic or recurrent disease. That study is open and enrolling globally. Uh, it's led by Dr. Brian Slomovitz. So we are doing the study now to prove um, that it is uh, superior. So I, we need to do trials. Um, do I think it's going to be positive? Yes, I do. Um, but, you know, I think we need to look at it. And and there may be differences, just like we see in, in colorectal, although it doesn't really seem to affect use of the depth of response between germline-like uh, Lynch versus sporadic loss of mismatch repair and whether or not there's some nuances there. Does that latter group require chemo plus Pembro and then Pembro, or can they just go straight to Pembro? Pembro? I think there's a lot of questions we're going to have to answer, but that study is ongoing. So I think um, with Ruby, the positivity and the mismatch repair per the press release, I actually don't know the data, so I can speak freely. Um, the press release wasn't surprising to me in MSI high, and I think incorporation of a of a checkpoint inhibitor with chemo and to follow, um, I'll say I've already adopted that. I mean, I'm not waiting um, for anything because we know I'm not waiting. I'm not risking patients' longevity to wait. Um, so I'm already doing that. You can shoot me. The I'm interested to see the magnitude of benefit in the microsatellite stable group because that's really going to be a key finding for how we – um, envision future control arms in clinical trials, say, of drugs that target HER2. None of those are MSI high. It's all MSS. So is my control group Taxol Carbo? Is my control group Taxol Carbo chemo checkpoint? It's going to depend on that magnitude of benefit, and I haven't seen that yet. So I'm very interested to see this play out, um, and I don't know the results. So I'm going to be surprised like the rest of you. So, Mike, in terms of MS stable disease, obviously we have the Lenvatinib uh, Pembro study. That's really been the standard now in MS stable patients. People, uh, you know, have issues trying to you know, deal with the toxicity, particularly Lenvatinib toxicity and dose. You might want to comment on that. But you would think that the Ruby trial, I guess, if it's positive enough, it's going to be going after, the, you know, potentially the same patient's first line. It's going to ch completely change, I guess, the second line approach. Uh, first of all, any comments right now about using lenvatinib Pembro? I always love to ask what the starting dose is of lenvatinib that you like to use uh, and what we know about it in terms of efficacy and tolerability in general. Yeah, I, I, again, this is, a, this, is a sort of, this is a roaring success story. It's a little hard to brag about this after we saw all of the uh, survival and PFS curves that Katie showed for ovary. But, you know, 
you have to step back and think about this. this is, you know, recurrent metastatic endometrial cancer, which frankly, a lot of us would give hormones to nothing else, or maybe a little chemo and we wouldn't have any success. Uh, take a look at these curves. You're seeing the uh, progression-free survival on the left. And you're seeing the overall survival on the right. The overall, and, and you're seeing the proficient group on top and the all patients below. The hazard ratios for the lower is a little bit better because you've got incorporated some uh, mismatch repair deficient patients. Uh, but the bottom line is not only are you seeing a PFS prolongation, but you're seeing a huge effect, I think, from survival. So it's a home run. We use it. There's a lot of debate still. I'm a purist, so I started 20. I'd be curious to see what Katie does. But I, I dose reduce very quickly. I do know a lot of colleagues rely on the data on the initial study that the average dose used was 14. And so they started 14. They do have a few that started 10. Uh, I don't know how one does that when it's really not been tested. Uh, but I certainly do recognize uh, the the, the complexities of the levatinib. There's a lot of uh, diarrhea. There's a lot of robust hypertension. So you have to be careful about that. And there's a lot of fatigue. And as you know, that's a very strange drug because when we use it as a single agent, the, the single most important toxicity was weight loss. And, the, and it, was, it was central, meaning that patients just didn't, they lost their appetite. So interesting drug, but we use it very aggressively. Lenvatinib plus Ozampic will be the cure for obesity. Just kidding. Oh, my God. All right, let's go. We could. <laughs> no. Anyhow. <laughs> All right, let's talk about something completely different, and I'm really interested to see this uh, sliding into gynecologic oncology, Selenexer, a drug that I always thought was uh, very interesting in terms of how it worked. Uh, it looks like it has efficacy. One of the things this recent data set that uh, Krishna was talking about from uh, ESMO Plenary, I thought it was fascinating. And Mike, maybe you want to comment a little bit on how the drug works, but also the fact it seems to work much better in the wild type P53. Which I don't remember seeing before in a solid tumor play out like this. How does it work so, and why does it work better if you don't have P53 mutant? Yeah, I, I think it's really actually quite exciting. Uh, it's already approved for myeloma, so I can't say it's you know first in class here, but but it's a class of drugs that's not been extensively tested. Uh, and it targets the exportant pathway, which mean is a, which is a um, pathway that exists essentially to take things out of the nucleus, pump them out. So if you block that, proteins are retained in the nucleus. And if you think about it, if you've got a lot of um, tumor suppressor genes, RB, Fox uh, three, uh, p fifty three, and they're a wild type. They could get stuck in the nucleus and accumulate. And of course, that can slow cellular growth. It can even induce apoptosis. So that's that's the model. Uh, and it's now arrived into uh, GYN cancers. And what's interesting about this data, as you point out, is that there's a fairly dramatic effect on endometrial cancers that have wild type P53 as opposed to mutant. If you were to retain a mutant protein, who cares? But if you retain a wild type, you may be inducing apoptosis and the things that we want to do. So I, I think it's interesting. Um, the toxicity is not um, is very manageable. So more to follow on this. You said the toxicity is manageable. Have you used it, Mike? I've actually not used it before disclosure. I don't know if Katie, Katie has have you used it. Yes, we had the study open. Uh, again, led by my partner, Dr. Richardson. Um, I will say it took us a bit to get these manageable. Uh, the nausea was substantial, and we had to get access to a um, pretty expensive antiemetic, dual acting antiemetic, in order to um, help patients stay on the dosing. Once we did that, it was kind of a game changer. But um, but I know Dr. Richardson worked a lot at our site. Uh, to streamline those processes because patients were not tolerating it. Remember, it's a maintenance in this setting. And so patients don't expect to weekly feel terrible. So with the anti-medics, it's doable. Um, and that has to be, uh, and I believe it is in there. They're, they're getting ready to launch uh, a follow-up study. And I believe that will be all incorporated into that protocol. 
Phase three, I think, right? And, yeah, phase three and, in TPH3 wild type. Yep. And check out the paper we have that uh, Krishna went through looking at molecular subtypes. But Mike, since you haven't used it, I thought you'd be interested to hear from a myeloma doc. Because actually, when we saw Salinexor go out into myeloma, a lot of the docs in practice had difficulty with toxicity. It was a major issue. They kind of played around with it. They started to decrease the dose, use it weekly, combine it with other agents. But uh, And still, a lot of people in practice have difficulty using the drug. I just, I don't know if you think this would be helpful, but here's Dr. McHale's take on it. I have the privilege of having used Selenexor, in fact, in hundreds of patients. And like every other drug in myeloma, we don't use it now the exact way it first came out. Every drug goes through its evolution. And in my pragmatic practice, when I use Selenexor, I think the major two shifts we have seen is number one, that it's used weekly, number two, that it's used at lower dose. And in fact, maybe even number three, that we give it with very particular supportive care. So I use Selenex for all the time. The supportive care is fundamental. And I simplify it by saying this. First of all, you must give two anti-nauseants to patients prophylactically. You don't wait until they experience nausea. So I give a 5-HT3 antagonist, something like ondansetron, along with a lanzapine, which I find helps with the, if you will, mental nausea that patients can get with this. The first month is the worst month. I've really found that patients, once they get through that more difficult first month, then it becomes a lot easier. And with time, we might be able to taper down those anti-nauseants. And particularly close monitoring in that first month has been my recipe of success in using Selenexor. Katie, any thoughts? I mentally agree. That's our experience as well. Dual, dual antiemetics prophylactically um, before each dose, which is weekly. Uh, that's how this protocol was, uh, was our ticket to success and compliance on protocol. So to be continued, a few other uh, random issues. We'll talk a little bit about cervical cancer. I don't think quite as much happening there as uh, ovary and endometrial. But, uh, Mike, I did want to ask you about HER2. I mean, across all these gynecologic tumors because, you know, TDXD is so interesting as it sort of infiltrates into the solid tumor space. We were talking about before, now used routinely in HER2 mutant lung cancer, HER2 overexpressed uh, not only gastric where it's approved, but also uh, colorectal where it has activity. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of wondering whether we're going to get to a point, Mike, uh, where HER2 is going to be uh, looked for regardless of the tumor type. Any thoughts, uh, particularly about this agent specifically, yes. TDXD and gynecologic cancers? Mike, have you had any? I, I, we had a couple of patients with endometrial who community-based oncologists treated with TDXD. I don't know how he got a hold of it, and the patient had great responses. What do you think is going to happen with gynecologic oncology, Mike? I, I think it's a great point, Neil, and, and we're routinely now staying for um, hair to expression. Uh, and even if it's, you know, it used to be that we look for amplification because it's driving the tumor. Don't do that anymore. We just look for expression. And, you know, if we see it in uh, pap serous, then it's on our list. I like that. Uh, um, abstract that you pulled out in particular because Alessandro has been working on carcinosarcoma sarcoma his whole life. He does great work. And that bar is extremely low in carcinosarcomas sarcomas because nothing works very well. So I, I love that. And just full disclosure, I'll let you know that we're using uh, Uprate, Nappy 2B, on some of our carcinosarcomas sarcomas because it's expressed. So it's the same issue. Antibody drug conjugate probably is effective. Yeah. I think, can I just add something to that? So just because sure. I, I know there's a lot of people listening. So carcinosarcoma is, we're, we're just still learning. With these new antibody drug conjugates, just like in breast, HER2 low, all of a sudden we have more patients who are HER2 eligible now for monotherapy. And then there's some very interesting combinations which um, may upregulate HER2 so that anyone can get it because everyone's got some HER2. It's just, are you picking it up? But HER2 1 plus 2 plus fish negative um, are now eligible for these medications. And in the um, trastuzumab deruxtecan carcinosarcoma, they broke it out by HER2 2 plus fish 3 versus low. And it's small numbers. And so the confidence intervals overlap, but it's like 30 and 50%. In a setting where nothing works. So this like testing 
for her to IHC in any carcinosarcoma sarcoma with a serous component or even a high-grade component. I'm testing my high-grade endometrioids now, and I'll find low, one plus or two plus ish negative. Um, and we have trials. The trastuzumab direct scan, of course, has the jump, but duality DB1303 is open in expansion in endometrial. We have Bolt, which is a HER2 um, immune conjugate. All of these are looking at some function of HER2 low. And even we're testing our ovarian cancers in the recurrent setting and finding some, and I have some of them on trial, and the drug works. So it's going to be, you know, test for folate receptor alpha, test for HER2, you know, we'll have tests for NAPI3. Like this is going to be the IHC platform, I predict, moving forward. Um, so you can really line up these active drugs and use them earlier rather than empirically picking PLD, you know, it's so the field is just really changing, but these drugs are awesome. Small number of patients, niche, right? Her two is not everyone. But man, you got to find them. You got to find them. Particularly relevant, Katie, for a patient population, which I still get referrals after they've seen Adrian Iphosphamide. Yep. Talk about toxicity. So very yep. helpful. Yep. And cervix, cervix adeno, cervix adeno, her two, got a test for it. 40% positive. That drug works. Don't forget about ILD. Anyhow, just a couple of final words. It wasn't quite as big a year for cervical cancer, but Mike, we saw some follow up uh, from the keynote A26 study looking at Pembro, chemo, and bevacizumab. Um, also, we saw uh, more data with the, another antibody drug conjugate to sodomab, vidotin. Uh, Mike, can you kind of summarize where we are right now with checkpoint inhibitors in cervical cancer? Well, they're clearly here to stay, and I think the follow-up for 826 was simply showed that every subset, every subgroup benefited, and that, it, and that included um, whether or not you had bevacizumab, so I think it's safe to give with Bev um, and equally effective. Tizo uh, is a really interesting agent, another antibody drug conjugate, and, and what you can see in the slides is that um, it's easy to combine with other drugs, which is helpful. In this case, it's Pembro and Carbo. And I think you know where they're going with the Carbo. Um, so this agent is an antibody drug conjugate targeting tissue factor. Has some toxicities, but again, I think relatively uh, easy to manage, particularly tissue factor is in the coagulation pathway. And so you get some um, epistaxis, but that's not too big of an issue. You do have ocular toxicities, but in this case, the ocular toxicity, most of the time is conjunctivitis or dry eye, not as much keratitis. So I personally think even though the trials have a fair, um, fairly aggressive ocular management, I think it's actually quite easy to mitigate it. Go ahead, Katie. I was going to say that paper that you had up there is a really key paper. It's very well done on ocular toxicities. And so for um, the listeners who maybe haven't used tezotimab and are worried about the eye toxicity, that paper is really well done, ophthalmologist guided, um, a very good guideline. And I would encourage just downloading that um, for education purposes. It's very good. I'm not so an Katie author. And Mike just <laughs> Oh, that's a real endorsement. So uh, Katie and Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. So much going on in oncology in general, including gynecologic oncology. Come on back tomorrow night, audience. We're going to talk about thyroid cancer and neuroendocrine tumors. And maybe you don't see it that often, but lots and lots going on. Targeted therapy and thyroid cancer. So interesting. Be safe, stay well, and have a great night. Thanks so hi, much, Doc. Mike. Thanks so much, yeah. Katie. Say hi to Lori for me. <laughs>